Hello everyone, my name is Maurice Altaf uh, from SolidCAD. I'm an account manager um, and I specialize in AEC productivity tools. Uh, today we'll be talking about CTC. We've got uh, with us Sean Zervis. He's a technical evangelist um, with CTC software. He'll be going through um, and introducing BIM Project Suite for you today. Um, just an overview of SolidCAD and CTC, what we have to offer and what we do. Uh, we provide training for our clients, BIM consulting, um, simulation and analysis. Um, there's a lot of events um, that are hosted uh, as well, uh, and some scan, scan to BIM services. We are we have fifteen offices across Canada and twelve training facilities. We also offer free of cost solid assist technical support to all of our clients. This is besides Autodesk um, support. Associations and sponsorships. And some of our par partner products. We are um, an auto uh, Autodesk authorized uh, reseller. Today we'll be focusing on CTC. We partnered with CTC um, in 2018 and uh, we've had a great relationship and, and, and we're growing well with CTC. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, BIM Project Suite. Sean, if you want to take, take it from here. Thank you, Mohiz. Well, as Mohiz mentioned, we're going to be talking about the BIM Project Suite today. We're going to go over a pretty comprehensive introduction on this suite. Now, the, the Project Suite, just to kind of give you a quick introduction, this allows any Autodesk Revit user to automate a ton of basic mundane and routine tasks, things like managing and creating views and working more effectively with data. There's a lot of information this can help you with. The BIM Project Suite really is meant for anybody who uses Revit. If you're in Revit at all, any skill level, the BIM Project Suite is really meant for you. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of the tools and lightly demonstrate some of them. If you want to see more about the tools, if you download a trial of them or if you've already got the suite, uh, you can certainly open up any one of the tools in the trial or in the full version and take a look at the videos that goes much more in depth to what we're going to be talking about today. Again, these are the major things that I'm going to cover. Taking a look at how you can identify the free tools versus licensed tools because the BIM Project Suite does have a lot of free tools available to you that give you a ton of value. We're also going to describe a couple of the popular tools, the ones that most companies, regardless of discipline, can get some benefit out of instantly. We'll take a look at how you can get your hands on the suite in case you don't have it already, and also a little bit about how you can install this. So in case you need to involve your IT teams, you can do that very easily um, by leveraging these. Instead of doing a full death by PowerPoint presentation, I'm actually going to go live in Revit and start talking about these tools on screen in the Revit environment. In today's example, I happen to be in Revit 2018. I think that's an important note because many of us span multiple versions of Revit. In some of our companies, we actually have to have multiple versions installed all at the same time. And all of the CTC Express tools support Revit versions 2017 through Revit 2020. So anything in between, of course, it'll work on all of them. Our focus today is right here on the BIM project suite. Now, I was going to tell you right away, free tools versus licensed tools. The free tools, and this is true for all of our suites, are the tools that are in light colors. The light green tools here, these are all free. If you download this today, yes, you'll get a 14-day trial, and the tools in dark colors will stop working after 14 days unless you get a license. But these light colored green tools, they'll work forever. So there's no reason really not to get this suite because there's a lot of power even in those free tools. Of course then, obviously, the dark color tools are not free. They do require some kind of licensing. And as far as licensing goes, we do offer both standalone and network licensing. So if you wanted to buy, say, one network license and share that amongst a number of your peers, this suite actually supports that very easily. And just kind of talking about the 2017 uh, through 2020 versions, 
one license supports all versions of Revit. So you don't have to buy one license per version year. You just buy one license, and all those version years work. So let's talk about some of the popular tools here in the project suite. There's obviously quite a few tools across the ribbon. You may not use all of them. In fact, no company that I've ever worked with uses all of them. Most companies will pick and choose a few tools that are really meaningful for them on uh, different tasks that affect their daily workflows. But I'm going to talk about a couple of tools here today that really do work pretty much for almost everybody. On the BIM project suite, I'll start with some of the free tools here. Quick Select is a great tool. This one allows you to, to select elements in your model based on its properties. You know, in Revit, you can select objects, right? I can pick on this thing here as a title block, and I can use this little filter option down here on the uh, ribbon, or there's another filter option someplace in the interface. I never go to it, though. Um, and you can filter by Revit category. But rarely is that really enough to filter something. So the Quick Select tool actually lets you filter by object property. You want to select all walls that have a one-hour fire rating? It can help you do that. You want to select all pieces of ductwork that are eight inches tall? Go for it. It'll let you do that. Um, by actually using element properties. Another fantastic free tool is renumbering. Again, useful for all disciplines because everybody places views on sheets. This will help you very easily go through and renumber the views that you've placed on sheets, especially those large detail sheets with 20, 30 details on them, and renumber them in the sequence that you want. If you're working in an architectural environment, this also helps you do things like renumbering uh, rooms, doors based on rooms, it's structurally grid lines that let you renumber those. So it's a great little quick tool set to be useful across a number of different renumbering tasks. If we jump into some of the paid tools, a few of the really useful tools here, View Creator. In fact, I'm going to be demonstrating this tool today uh, and showing you how on this background starter project from my company template, I can actually generate a ton of views in a standardized way very quickly. So users can leverage this to kick off a project really quickly to generate all the floor plans and dependent views that they need. We'll dig into that in just a minute. Another really powerful tool on this suite is Spreadsheet Link. This is probably my Swiss Army Knife tool. Anytime someone asks me, hey, can I do this thing with information in Revit? Usually, I'm going to be doing that with Spreadsheet Link. A lot of the times when people are developing Dynamo routines, a lot of times that's to just take data and pull it to Excel and manipulate it and bring it back in. Not always, obviously. But when that's the case, Spreadsheet Link can actually be a very easy and straightforward tool to use. I'll be demonstrating this one as well because it's so powerful. Schedule Excel is actually a really good companion to that. Revit itself has no real way of taking graphics from the Excel environment and bringing that back into your model. I mean, yeah, you can print to an image, and yeah, you can link to a DWG as uh, an OLE table link or whatever that is, but then you have to go through a couple of extra hops to get that into the Revit environment. Schedule Excel can take an Excel graphic directly and bring it into Revit with all of its formatting. Background cell infills, conditional formats, cell borders, merge cells, all that can come in through Schedule Excel very easily. So your abbreviations, legends, and other things, you can use that. In fact, I'm going to pair Spreadsheet Link and Schedule Excel later on today in one of the little demonstrations and workflows that I can show you. There are a number of other tools in here as well. I'm going to skip over a few of them and talk about this one right here, Invisibility Advisor. Almost every company I've ever walked into and talked to about can, you know, issues with Revit, it's when users are having elements invisible in their views and they can't figure out why they can't see them. They've gone through the standard you know, two or three or five checklist items that they know to look for, and they still can't figure out why that object's not showing. Invisibility Advisor knows about all 58 reasons why something can be hidden in Revit and helps you resolve it. In most cases, it'll just fix it. In some cases, it'll bring you to where that control happens to be. And in all cases, it'll just help you understand better why things are not visible. In most cases, users can leverage this to go from like a 30 or 40 minute invisibility resolution you know, process down to like less than five minutes. Huge time saver. If we have time today, I'll definitely dig in and talk about this tool. And then there's one more tool that's kind of architectural in focus, but I want to mention this because it's brand new. In case you haven't seen the, the, or in case you have seen the project suite in the past, this tool is brand new and it might be meaningful for you now as well. This is the Occupant Flow Analyzer. Many of you may have seen the path tool that exists in Revit 2020. There's a couple problems with that tool. It only works on a single floor. It's uh, only one point to one other point, and it only works in Revit 2020. Well, the Occupant Flow Analyzer, as you can see, I'm in Revit 2018, and with all of our tools, they work all the way as far back as 2017. 
This does understand multiple floors of buildings, and it can do full egress analysis from all of your rooms to points of egress if you want. And it can also help do things like figuring out occupancy and, and uh, doing point-to-point -point analysis if you want, and drawing the paths actually as well, schedule-capable paths. So it's a powerful tool if you're in the architectural space and you actually have to do some egress planning. All right. Um, there's obviously a lot of other tools. Model Compare is powerful. It allows you the ability to take a snapshot of a model at different points in time and then compare them together to figure out what exactly has changed. A lot of my uh, contractors and uh, uh, consulting engineers like leveraging this when they receive architectural models so they can figure out exactly what the differences are from the previous iteration of the model to the current iteration. There's other tools like Parameter Jammer, the ability to, to download external content from outside your firm and very easily have end users make it work with your schedules. It's not designed to be a super powerful tool. It's just designed to help with a bit with efficiency. Instead of a user needing to go in and try and figure out you know, what shared parameters are needed or involving a BIM manager and spending a half hour to an hour of time, in a matter of about five minutes, they can pick the, the element, the schedule that it's supposed to work with, and have this tool help them resolve it by pushing the right parameters into that family. A lot of different tools. Room data sheets, right? I'm just talking about these tools, quick overviews, because some of these are just incredibly powerful and save tons of time. Both architecturally and in MEP, when you're using rooms and or spaces, you can create enlarged floor plan views, ceiling plan views, elevations, schedules, 3D views if you want, of a room or a space, and isolate those elements very quickly and have them all tossed onto a sheet. If you've got multiple electrical closets running up a building, this tool can help you build specific detail sheets for those. If you've got a ton of patient rooms in an architectural project, this tool can help you get all those patient room data sheets set up. This can be a fantastic tool set to really save a lot of time in view and sheet creation for things that are room and space specific. And I can go on and on about all these. But you know what? I think you probably want me to dig in and start showing some of these tools directly. I'm going to start with View Creator. I'm going to start with this tool because I have a starter project opened up, and I have no floor plan views. Yeah, I do have a bunch of elevations. I've gone through and actually created a series of elevations here, but you can tell probably from the datum symbols that there are no floor plans associated with any of them. They're all black, meaning that there's no floor plan associations. I have a seven-level building, a lower level underground, and then six levels above grade plus a roof, so eight total levels, and I need to create all the floor plans for things like, and I'm going to use an architectural example, but like finished plans, life safety plans, general floor plans. Um, maybe this is an existing building, so I want to do some, some uh, existing and demo plans. And probably, depending on my building layout, I might need some enlarged floor plans. And so we're going to quickly go through View Creator and have this tool help us generate well over 300 floor plan views here in a matter of minutes while I'm talking. So I'm going to click on View Creator. I have, some, I have a lot of functionality in here, but I'm going to highlight just two things, floor, uh, floor plan and ceiling plan creation and dependent view creation. Obviously, there's a lot of other tabs for you to investigate, and I encourage you to take a look at the videos in this tool. If you download a trial or uh, have this tool yourself already, take a look at those videos. On the plan and ceiling area here, I've already set up my levels, and I already have some abbreviations configured. I also already have in my template all the view templates that I want to work with. My list is rather short. You probably will want more. Maybe you've already got more. But this list is entirely customized by how many view templates you have that are related to floor plans, structural plans, or area plans. And then over here in my phasing area, I've also got all the phases that currently exist in my project. And what I'm going to do is use a combination of those three things to build up all the floor plan views that I need down here for my overall plans. I'm simply going to start checking some boxes here. I want plans for all of my levels. I want life safety demo plans, finish plans, general, presentation plans, maybe even some working plans, all for the new construction right here. And when I add those to my list below, it starts to build me up a list of all those views. I also have the ability to go in there with existing plans and tell it that maybe I want to you know, not do a demo plan for those, but I want to have all these existing working plans and general plans and maybe, I don't know, existing code plan even for life safety. I don't know, whatever you want. I'm going to have it generate all these views and it just built me up a list, in this case with the suffix of existing, for those that are going to be associated with that existing phase, and I can tell it to create the views. This will take it a second because it's going to run through, well, only a second, I guess. It just generated for me 88 floor plan views. And because of how I have my view templates configured, if you look over here in the project browser, you'll see that I've got different floor plan groupings already set up. 
coincidentally, they kind of match pretty closely with my view template names. You may also notice that I've got existing up here as a phase setting. If I close View Creator and expand that out, I have similar floor plan groupings here. And I have all of those different types of plans all set up with existing suffixes. In Revit natively, if you were to go manually create these, you'd be building floor plans, but it only builds them for the latest phase. You have to then go back and reassociate phase. Here, this is already associated this to existing. If I scroll down, you can see my plan phase is existing, and my view template is associated to presentation. It's already done, and the name matches that as well. This is a huge time saver. General plans all done throughout my entire building with a standardized naming convention, my finished plans, my demo plans, code plans, everything's all done. All that's left for me to do now is start doing some drawing. So if I go to one of these floor plans and I start laying out my building, which I kind of cheated on, I already did the drawing of the building here, but I've got a building laid out. Now that I've got some basic design, maybe I decide, you know what, I need to start doing some enlarged plans. I want like area A and area B over here, maybe area C for the center core of the building, D and E. Well, to do that normally, I'm going to take all of my normal floor plans where I need those enlarged plans, right-click, duplicate the view, duplicating first, and then calling it like enlarged or master or something like that, and then coming back floor by floor, view type by view type, and duplicating as a dependent, in my case, five times per view type, per floor, uh, all the way throughout my building. That's hundreds of right-click duplicates as a dependent. And then I get the super fun job of coming back and renaming all those and associating scope boxes. Man, that's like a great time, right? That's, that's an entire day of just screwing around and doing view duplications. Well, what I'm going to do is cheat a little bit. Well, I'm going to do this as efficiently as possible. I'm going to create a scope box out here, and I'm going to give it a name to identify this as my area A. This is going to happen real time in front of you. Area A, I'm going to take that scope box and make a copy of it across my building, maybe having a little bit of overlap for some of that common area. Give myself area C and area D down here. Maybe again, I do a little resizing of this box, maybe rotating it so I can match the wing angle of that building, whatever that happens to be. What is this? 4.03 degrees. Perfect. See, I'm practicing architecture here, some arbitrary angle that doesn't line up with anything. And then I'll copy this down the, uh, the building angle. And uh, yeah, there we go. So I've got all of my building areas. And because of how scope boxes work, the names automatically increment themselves. Scope boxes have to be unique. So I put in one name, and now all of a sudden I've got all five of those areas defined. Let's go back into View Creator and have it do some work for us here. We built the 88 major floor plans that we needed for the general plans. Now what I'm going to do is build all the enlarged plan masters out here. Simply going to check some boxes. Again, check whatever I feel is appropriate. And for today's example, I'm just going to do the new construction. That's all I'm going to work on. Let's see here. New construction, that's it. I'm going to call this out as enlarged and then add those to my list. So it won't be quite 88 floor plan views. It's going to be, I don't know, maybe 50 something. But I'm going to create those views real quick. 48, yeah, 48 floor plan views, all made as enlarged. And I could, of course, come back and modify those scales, no big deal. The dependent views over here, this is where the real trick comes into play. All I'm going to do is start highlighting all these enlarged plans. Shift select them all. Tell it to check all those selected boxes for these individual areas. You can see my scope box names listed there across the top. And I'm going to tell it to create my dependent views. This takes a second longer because it's got five times the amount of work to do to duplicate and assign the scope box and rename it. But it's duplicating all these as dependents. In just a moment here, you should see over in, the, like in front of the 00, zero code plan enlarge, a little plus sign show up for each one of those that are the enlarged plans because it's duplicating them five times. We just made 240 additional floor plan views. We're well over 300 floor plan views here in a matter of, I don't know, what, four or five minutes of me talking about this. And all of those have all been configured with standardized naming. If I go down to my 01 floor plan enlarged, let's take a look at this area D down here. This is the angled wing of my building. If I open up that area D, because I rotated that scope box, you might notice it's actually square to screen. This makes it real easy for me to come out here and start drawing whatever I feel is appropriate relative to the angle of that wing, and knowing that my overall floor plan out here is going to have that stuff aligned perfectly. Easy view setup. Over 300 floor plan views configured using View Creator in a matter of five minutes instead of a matter of all day. Right? Super simple workflows. Now instead of continuing to develop this model, I'm going to tab over to an office building that already has some work done in there. And that's because I want to show you Spreadsheet Link and Schedule Excel and how they can work together. First though, let's take a look at Spreadsheet Link 
and what it can do. So in Revit, when I first started using this tool, I was super excited. I'm going to open up the uh, life safety code plan over here and pick on one of these rooms so you can see exactly what got me excited about Revit when I switched over from AutoCAD. If I click on this room, this is training room one, room 117. This room here, if I go to the floor material and put in something like CPT-1, you might expect that if I go to a schedule, because you've probably been using Revit for a while, if I go to a schedule, this room 117 for that floor material probably will have CPT-1 in there. Let's go find out. Uh, scroll down here. Here's my schedules. And uh, look, I've got a room finish schedule in this project. That's fantastic. And if I scroll down, yep, there it is, room 117, training room 1, CPT-1. Fantastic. That was cool. That got me super excited about Revit. And if I look over here, maybe I should pull this off to the side for you so you can see this as well. My north wall finish right there is currently empty. And if I put in PNT-1 and I go back to that floor plan, again, you're going to expect that that particular room right here, this room, room 117, would have PNT-1 in there. Super exciting, right? That's great. But this is where Revit sort of got me a little disillusioned. When I'm working with this schedule, coming from the AutoCAD world in the first place, I want to be able to like take this row and copy, arrow down, and paste. Control C, Control V. Super simple. Except for sometimes Revit's kind of dumb, and Revit doesn't let you do that. It's kind of silly because I just want to take three fields of data and copy and paste it between two different rooms. Can't do it. Now, yes, I know I can do some other stuff like making a schedule key for rooms and then have a, some kind of a key code for all my room finish stuff. And that works. That kind of works. But I've got to go use a different schedule. It's not quite as convenient. And I have to teach people different workflows. And if I wanted to make a variant of this room, I have to go back to that schedule and make a change or strip away the key and then fill all the information in again because the schedule key, when removed, clears all the data that it's driving. And that kind of sucks. I don't like it. So what I want to do instead is find a much easier way of editing this schedule. The spreadsheet link is going to be the tool that lets me do that. I'm going to open up spreadsheet link, and I'm going to leave this schedule on screen so you can see this stuff happen live. The lower left-hand corner of my spreadsheet link settings window lets me choose a couple of different ways of getting data, either from categories of objects, all the instances of elements that exist in my model, from the types of objects that exist using type definitions, or check this out, I can actually use schedules. So I have a list of schedules that already know what type of data to go after. Let's use that. If I pick that, it'll give me a list of all of my schedules. And look at this. There's a room finish schedule already in the list. So I'm going to pick that room finish schedule, the exact same schedule that I was using over here, and it's going to pull all of my data in. It knows already what information, what fields it was I wanted to go after. Now granted, Excel works a little different than Revit, so it formats a little differently. But check this out. I've got training room one sitting right here. And if I want to use Excel-like power, I can do things like auto-filling information across. Or maybe you don't want to auto-increment. I, I personally don't here. I'm just going to like control drag this across so it doesn't auto-increment for me. Maybe I want to highlight an entire row and copy-paste. I can do that. Granted, it's not auto-filling out here at the same exact time. That would be a little tedious and slow. But what I get to do is you know, work with this information myself and auto-fill as much information as I want or copy-paste and do some data entry. Maybe I even want to take this and save it out as an Excel spreadsheet someplace on my computer hand this off to some other team member who maybe doesn't feel comfortable in Revit, or maybe I don't want them in Revit. But I can give this off to them in Excel and let them work on it. And when they're done, I can simply open it back up or take my data that I've edited directly and apply this right back to my model. So this fills out all that exact same information here. In this case, I filled out 21 rooms worth of data by using simple Excel-based controls. You might be asking yourself, hey, Sean, that's cool, but can I also do things like formulas? Yeah, actually you can. You have the full power of Excel at your fingertips. Anything you can do in Excel, Spreadsheet Link can do with you and for you as well. So let's take a look at an example where maybe I would want to use the power of Excel because maybe Revit can't do what I want. Here's a really good example, again, sticking with the room. And this also works great for those of you in the MEP space. If you pick on a space, or in the case of architecture, a room, Revit has this parameter called occupancy, which is text, and it's dumb. I've made my own because I want to use it for other things. And down here, I've got this set up as a number property. But still, it's dumb. Yeah, I can link it to a global parameter, but that global parameter can't reference itself. I can't have that global parameter talk to my own area and talk to another parameter and do some basic maths like area divided by area per person rounded up to the nearest whole person and give me some value here. You can't do that in Revit. It's kind of silly, but you can't. 
I wish I could. Now, with, if this was a door, a loadable family, yeah, I could do that kind of thing. But with a door, for example, I can't have the door understand what wall it's in and pull the wall's fire rating across and do something with that data. But you know what can do that? In both cases, I can leverage Spreadsheet Link to handle that kind of intelligence for me. I'm going to pan this down into the side a little bit so you'll see this happen more or less live. But I'm going to do a basic setup of this real quick, and then I'm going to do something that's a bit more advanced, and then we'll tie into the Schedule Excel side. With Spreadsheet Link, what I'm going to do is grab rooms myself manually. I'm just going to go in here and grab the category of rooms. Last time I used schedules as a source. This time I'm just going to directly pick the room and pull it across. And it's going to take it a second to scan all the rooms and give me all the data values that I want to work with. This now becomes a whole lot like putting together a normal Revit schedule. Maybe I want to grab the level. You can see all the levels showing up out here. I want to grab area. There's area. There's my area per person CTC parameter. Uh, let's see, what else did I have? Occupancy, my CTC occupancy parameter. I'm just pulling fields across. And then just like Excel, if I wanted to do something here, I can type in whatever I want, you know, just type in some garbage, or I can go in here and do a formula like equals one plus one. You know, I can, I can do whatever Excel type work I want to do. Yeah, but Sean, one plus one is silly. You want to take area divided by area per person. Absolutely I do. Equals this divided by this. Uh, except for because Revit has units of measure associated to it, like square meters or square feet, I have to find a way to strip that away. And yeah, I can write some kind of a formula that says trim off the right three characters or whatever, but that's a little more complicated than I want to dig into. In fact, a lot of people need to use this, so we've built into the settings window the ability to hide the unit symbol coming out of Revit, so it'll give me the raw value. This is especially important if you're dealing with something that includes things like feet and inches. Maybe I've got perimeter here. I know a lot of Canada uses you know, metric measurements for millimeters, but there are still a lot of projects that leverage feet and inches. And if that's the case, and you're trying to trim this down and do some maths against the distance, that can be a little tricky. But with the hide unit symbol t uh, feature here, when I check that box, it's going to run through and strip the square feet away and put square feet up here on the top. It does the same thing for that feet, that feet and inches mark. It gives me decimal feet in this case, or decimal you know, meters or whatever, and I'm now able to do proper math against these different values. Well, I'm going to remove perimeter. I don't need that in this case. I'm just going to oops, pick my rooms here, remove perimeter. There we go. That's gone. Let's go back and do something here. Equals this divided by this. Okay, simple something simple. And I can autofill this myself, but you know what? I'm lazy, or what we also like to call efficient. I'm going to check the box here for calculated right next to occupancy so it knows whatever formula I put in the topmost cell, it auto propagates that down for all the other cells. For as many rooms or doors or whatever it is I have, it'll take care of this for me and stops at the end. Huge time saver because now I can write repeatable workflows that end users can leverage. Maybe I want to do things like round up to the nearest whole person. Right? Round up, do some maths, round to zero decimal places, call it good. That happens, propagates all the way down. Maybe I have to handle things like sell, uh, uh, rooms that are, that are not occupiable. That, that's an error in this case. I can do an if error statement. Whatever Excel controls you know you can leverage here. Instead of me building this up though, I want to show you something else you can do. Like I said, you can save your settings. And you can also do what's called an advanced save. In this tool, if I do an advanced save, I can have this know how to pre-open up an already existing Excel workbook. You know what's important about that? I'm not just doing <coughs> occupancies here because it's fun, because I want to show some numbers. I'm doing occupancies because I have to figure out egress loading on doors. I want to figure out how many water closets and drinking fountains and labs I need on a floor-by-floor -floor basis or a smoke room-by-smoke -smoke room basis. So I can go through and write some rules and write some additional tabs in an Excel workbook that do things that Revit itself cannot do. And then later, I can call those settings up. So I'm going to load some settings from an outside file here. Let's go find some settings. Let's see here. Uh, Revit Express tool settings. I've got uh, spreadsheet link. Here we go. Uh, room calculations. And I've got this little collection of stuff here. Notice how I've got all these extra tabs. Water closet, method one, two, three, urinals, labs, all these different highly formatted Excel spreadsheets, all of them are looking at this rooms tab. It's currently blank. What I'm going to do is overwrite that rooms tab with information coming out of my project right now. My formula might look a little different. It's basically doing the same thing except for it's rounding down instead of rounding up, and it's handling situations where there are no you know, occupiable numbers put in that room. And it's also rounding down to the nearest whole person. Unless it's less than one, then it rounds up to one. But 
you can write whatever logic you feel is, is appropriate. Once I do this, I can apply this active worksheet back to my model. And if you watch what's going on out here in these room tags, when I apply this active worksheet, it'll fill all those rooms information out. An end user could have gone through and opened up this, loaded some settings, and applied this back in a matter of you know, less than 60 seconds. And this has already done all the occupancy validation for their entire set of rooms in their model. In my case, 96 rooms. 58 were unoccupiable. But at the same time, I've now gone through and based on my rule sets, figured out for different counties, cities, provinces, whatever, figured out you know, what, the, what the different uh, water closet requirements are for that building what the different urinal or lav requirements or drinking fountain or parking spaces or whatever you want. This is all figured out. But now maybe this is something that I want to bring graphically back into Revit. That's not something Spreadsheet Link does. Spreadsheet Link takes the data and pushes and pulls data. If I want the graphics, well, I have to have a spreadsheet saved someplace, and I have to use the other tool, Schedule Excel. So let's save this out. I'm going to put this on my desktop. We're going to call this uh, Solid CAD rooms example. It wants to know if I want to open that up, and I'm going to answer no to that because I don't need to. I'm just going to shut this down. I've already got out of this what I needed, which was my occupancies filled out in a very rapid way from spreadsheet link settings. Oops, I don't need to save my settings either. Now let's turn around and use Schedule Excel. This is the tool that lets me take graphic Excel stuff and bring that back into my model. So we've already done the data exchange. Now let's do a graphics exchange. If you look over here in my schedules list, I have a number of schedules already existing. When I use Schedule Excel, I'm actually going to tell it to make me a Revit schedule, but it's going to get its data and its graphics from the Excel side. So you'll actually see uh, schedules appearing over here. And then we'll take those and drop them onto Sheets. When I open up Schedule Excel, I'm going to add a reference to that spreadsheet that I just saved out to my desktop right there, Solid CAD Rooms example. With that Solid CAD Rooms example, I'm going to bring in multiple worksheets because I don't want to have to do each one of these one by one. I want to be a little bit more efficient than that. There's a couple of tabs that I know I don't need, but I do want all these different methods of calculation so I can pick and choose what I need for my project, and I want this to build me a Revit schedule view. So I'm going to click OK. Now what's happening, if you watch carefully down in the schedules list, you'll actually start seeing those schedules appearing. And for each one of those 10 tabs that I told it to bring in, it's going to give me a Revit schedule. Each one of them populates. You have some settings as to what this prefix is with. In my case, I have it prefixed as Z-link, so I know it's coming from some kind of an outside link. It puts it at the end of my schedules list, and then it gives me the individual tab names coming from Excel. Fantastic feature of this tool. If users modify that spreadsheet in any way, this is told to auto-update. So just like DWG's links can update and Revit model links can update when you open up your model, this tool will do the exact same thing. If somebody reruns that uh, spreadsheet link workflow to rerun their calculations before printing and they save over that file, you can come right back into Schedule Excel or have it refresh the next time somebody opens that model and have this information all kept up to date. So there's no reprint images, no reopen DWG's and refresh that in your Revit model. This happens all automatically. What does it look like though? Well, let's go to a sheet and actually compile this on a sheet where I might want to use it. I'm going to leverage my title sheet. My title sheet already has the actual sheet list coming out of Revit on there. You can see the sheet list is sitting right up here. That sheet list is auto-populated. It's a normal Revit schedule. What I'm going to do is take some of these linked schedule Excel created spreadsheets, and I'm going to uh, drop, let's say, water closet method three out here. Just drag and drop that one at random. As I drop this onto my sheet, if you look carefully, you might notice the line weights going on out there. Heavy line weights at the border, maybe some medium line weights on the inside, some super light lines dividing some of the subsections inside of there. You can see some merged cells, all the exact same fonts coming out of the Excel side. Uh, background cell infills, I could also be using again uh, some, some uh, conditional formatting. And this thing works and, and lays out just like a normal Revit schedule would. If I drag this up to the top here, you'll notice that it tries to align with the top of this, the, the sheet list schedule. It does it on purpose. You might notice that the right side of this thing has a medium line instead of a heavy line. It looks kind of silly right now. Well, that's because I built this on purpose so it's modular. If I'm working in a province that requires this water closet calculation method and this urinal calculation method, and maybe this lav method, I can mix and match and bring in whatever parts and pieces I need to get exactly the layout that's appropriate for my current province, city, whatever. 
And now as I look at this, it looks like one cohesive schedule, works like one cohesive schedule, gets all of its data from a single Excel link that I've brought in here, this, this schedule Excel process, and it's filling itself out based on the occupancies that I calculated for my building. That's just one small workflow. Those of you in different disciplines, you might be doing, say, outdoor airflow for spaces in the MEP space. You might be doing different kind of circuit calculations or, um, I don't know, structural column quantification, right? You can do all of that using a spreadsheet link type workflow with automated calculations. There's a lot of different ways of using this and marrying that up with Schedule Excel. Maybe you want to do abbreviations legends. All kinds of stuff can be done there. Let's do one final thing. Uh, maybe two final things, we'll see. I'm going to use Invisibility Advisor here in my next step because I happen to know something isn't showing up the way that I want. And I'll explain to you exactly what it is, and we'll kind of try and figure this out together. And then I might, if I have enough time, we'll be able to show maybe the Occupancy Flow Analyzer. So let's jump back over here to my Life Safety or Code Plan. In my Life Safety Plan, I want to start figuring out egress pathing from each room to the nearest exit point. One of the things that I like to quantify when I'm doing my egress pathing is figuring out where large furniture is that's not going to be mobile. Right? If it's a plant, I'm going to move it aside, right? knock it over, whatever, nobody cares. But if it's a big piece of furniture, I'm going to go around that, and I want to quantify for that. I want to account for that. So I'm going to go into my visibility graphics and do what any user would do when they want to see furniture out here, and simply turn on my furniture. So there's my furniture. Check the box in visibility graphics. It's now visible, and I would expect to see furniture but it doesn't show. You might go, yeah, Sean, you noob. Why don't you just hit the little reveal hidden elements button down there? That always shows you stuff that's not showing up. Well, yeah, it always sometimes shows it to you. Sometimes it doesn't. And unfortunately, most of the time when you're expecting it to, it doesn't show you what you're looking for. So what I'm going to do now, since this didn't work, is I'm going to use another method. Right? Let's go first of all make sure I've got some furniture in this model. Maybe I go over here to like, the main floor finish plan. Do I have furniture? Yeah, I do actually, and it's live in my model right here. There's the same exact room. There's some furniture. And if I control tab, let's say, uh, let's say I select this room just to make sure I'm in the right spot. Yeah, same room. So I would normally expect to see the furniture here, but something is controlling it that's not letting it show. Let me close hidden windows so I don't have a bunch of extra garbage open and reopen that floor plan. I'm going to window tile this so we can actually uh, see this happen on screen live. Window tile. There we go. So I'm in the same area in my floor plan, side by side, seeing furniture in one view, and the same wall elements, the same room elements, everything all over the model. Here's the chair maybe that I want to try and find. It's not showing up. Why not? Well, we did reveal hidden elements already. We, uh, we, we did uh, visibility graphics to turn furniture on, but now there's 57 more reasons why that thing might not show up. And not everybody knows what they are. So let's use Invisibility Advisor. I'm going to open up this tool. I kind of cheated here a little bit. I already had the code plan view as my active view, and I would already selected the chair, so it's got that in my selection set. I could have selected it afterward. I know what view it is I'm trying to resolve the invisibility in. That's my active view in this case. I could drop this down and pick any view if I needed to. But I'm going to tell this to find the element for me. And it's going to run through all 57 other reasons, actually all 58 reasons, and check to see if any of them are valid for why this chair isn't showing up. Anything in gray is Maybe, but unlikely. I mean, it says line work overrides may have been made. Well, probably not, because it's a full chair symbol. Probably doesn't have line work done to it. So I'm going to ignore that one for right now. There's three other reasons why this might not be visible. There's an associated work set that might be invisible here. The uh, view range has been set to maybe obscure or hide this element. And there's also some view filters set in this view. So apparently somebody really didn't want to see that chair. Um, what I'm going to do is first of all show you manually where this is so you can see what the change is, but then I'm going to show you in Invisibility Advisor how this actually controls it. If I go Visibility Graphics manually, knowing now that these are the three things, I could manually go Work Sets and make this resolution to change finishes, furnishings, and equipment to not be hidden. I could do that myself. I could also take a look at, say, View Ranges over here. And for my View Ranges, make that change myself. Maybe in this case, it's the bottom of view that might be obscuring this object. I don't know. But there's a view filter as well. Well, that's back over here in the visibility graphics. So if I went to view filters, there's a filter set. That's all well and good, but not everybody knows what these different things mean. Maybe what I want to do is just blindly have this fix that problem. I'm going to click fix here and see what happens. 
this might give me a warning, and you can disable that if you want to, but this is going to warn me that it's going to maybe affect other things. But when I click Fix, it actually reached into my filter up my work sets and changed that setting for me. Made it back to the global setting. That saves me from digging around and trying to figure out where that is. If I do the same thing for view range, I can just click fix and it'll try to do its best to make that work out. I personally don't always blindly just click fix. That takes, that takes a lot of trust, especially in this case where sometimes that chair might be elevated on top of a finished floor and now it gives me some screwy like bottom and view depth option. I probably wouldn't want that I'm going to leave it as it is for now just to kind of show you that it's probably fixing it for you. You also can choose not to just blindly trust that. You can click show. When I click show, what it will try to do is bring me to the exact place in the interface where that control is. It will open up visibility graphics and it brings me to the filters tab. And now I can look through here and go, oh yeah, the furniture control is what's actually modifying that property. I can turn that on or maybe I want to make it half tone or do whatever, right? But I can start controlling things that might make that furniture now visible. So this visibility, uh, Invisibility Advisor very simply takes me through a little wizard that as an end user, I might not know all the reasons, but it tells me all the reasons to make this thing show up. And if I'm halfway through this manually fixing some things, I can click check again whenever I want. And as I do that, it'll rerun the full check and see if those things have been resolved. So if I'm manually changing view range, like if I went over here to view range and said, oh yeah, let's make this zero, right? Or zero right here. If I'm doing that myself, and I, I want to know, did it actually fix it? When I hit check again, it will rerun the full check, and then it will let me know if something was actually controlled or not controlled, if it's been resolved or not. Right? Instead of users messing around for a half hour and then involving you BIM managers on their processes, they can self-resolve these using the Invisibility Advisor and actually use this as a way to learn why things aren't showing up. Fantastic tool. Okay. I think I've got enough time to show this last tool here. I want to talk about the Occupant Flow Analyzer just a little bit. This is a very deep tool, so we can't go super in-depth with this. But what I do want to explain is that on this model, I've got occupancies set, as you already saw. Um, I calculated that using the Spreadsheet Link workflow. I could use the Occupancy Flow Analyzer to actually calculate my occupancies as well. And if you've got rules for different load calculations and different smoke zones and different ways that you want to round or not round or whatever, you can run those calculations on the Occupant Load Calcs tab. What I'm going to do though is work primarily with the path settings to understand where paths can go and also where they can't. In this case, I've set up some impassable objects. The full categories of casework and furniture, furniture systems and walls are all set to be impassable objects. So this tool will intentionally avoid those types of components. Over here I have one specific element, this generic model. I think it's actually maybe even an in-place family. It's up here in the top of my project. It's a, it's a plotter that sits in this back corridor. I want this to be avoided as well so people can't run through it. They have to go around it, and it gets calculated with any offsets that we're leveraging. I also have some rules set down here that say what the target flow loads can be. In my case, all my targets, the place where people are going to go, are exterior doors. And so with those exterior doors, I'm going to figure out my flow load based on my local codes saying I have 0 0.0125 of a foot or whatever unit of measure it is per whatever the property is of that component. So I'm going to use the width of the door and do some basic maths using 0 0.0125, uh, the width divided by that number to figure out what the exact number of occupants are that can egress this door in an emergency. If I have something like a double door, it might be a greater number. But this tool is going to help me with whatever that rule set is based on my, code, my local codes to figure out what egress positions or, 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 or numbers are actually valid. And then as the output over here, I have this told to calculate all paths. So every single possible path. In this case, I've got 25 people in this training room, 25 individual nodes, one from the furthest point and 24 from any other random point that it picks in this room will be uh, picked to egress out through this door and then out to whatever the closest exit is, whether it's this exit here or this exit over here. Same thing for this one. If I wanted to do just each longest path for each space, it could do that. So each room, it'll take the longest path and have 25 people run along that path out that door to whatever the, the closest exit is or I can do longest path for the entire selection, which would be for each individual egress point, there's one longest path. And in all cases, it's going to give me a report based on all those things. If I do all paths, I'm going to do this just for this one floor for you today, this can actually calculate everything for my building, uh, for this one floor of this building. 
Now, on my critical occupant paths here, I've already selected my egress points. There's five exit points on this building, one on a floor we can't see, and four on the level that we can see here. And I'm going to tell this for all spatial elements. Actually, let's do all spatial elements on my level, just level one here. I want this to find my paths. When I click Find Paths, it's going to run through and build a, an egress mesh out of this building. It's going to figure out all the numbers of occupancy that I've told it to use as, as values, in this case my occupancy CTC parameter, figure out the closest doors to each of the, the room's exit points, and then draw me paths for each of these rooms. In this case, all people in each of the rooms. This takes it a few seconds here. It's got seven total steps that it goes through, and it tells you what each step is. When it's all done with this, it'll ultimately give me a little report at the end that I can copy to Clipboard and then drop into an Excel spreadsheet if I want, and perhaps present that back to my model using Schedule Excel. But this gives me, in this case, a report saying that these two doors here had zero people going to them. The total load of each of those doors was 240. So no people, no distance. There's other doors here that had a, an occupancy load of 480, and 88 people are going that direction. In fact, I believe that's this door right here, this one at the exterior. Critical distance for that, 93 feet, 3 and 5, 15 sixteenths of an inch. That's the, the longest distance to get to that door. If I'd calculated the entire building, I might get some different numbers here, and I'm going to probably get longer critical distances for those that are egressing from other floors. But this goes through and gives me all the information that I could hope to have. And again, I could save this as an Excel spreadsheet and then use some way of bringing that into my model if I cared about presenting this on a code sheet. But ultimately, each one of those egress points or egress paths out here, they all have each of their nodes specified. There's going to be 26 nodes in this room, 25 in this room. Each one of them has a, a load count. So if I was to tab into this node right here, this will tell me that there's 25 occupants converging on that point to get out this door. And as I go around this corner down here, there's 52 total occupants going from the lounge, those two rooms, all going through that point to get out these doors down here at the bottom. That full path is an element that's actually a 3D model. You can schedule this component if you want to. In fact, you can even tag individual nodes in Revit. All these points are all available for each of these different egress zones in the building. If I had other impassable objects that were there for like smoke compartments or emergency doors that locked themselves closed, I could account for those and count those as impassable elements, and this would recalculate egress through the building. I happen to know that with this building, there's actually some error in the model. If I did a full building analysis, there'd be some major errors because up on fourth floor, there's a couple of missing doors where there's occupants, uh, occupancy defined for spaces, but there's no entrance or exit for those. And this tool will yell at me, letting me know that I've made a mistake. to allow everybody out in the case of an emergency. And so I either have to redesign part of the building uh, or change different accesses or give more, you know, better access to this stair over here or whatever so that people can actually get out safely. But this tool can help you analyze that very quickly without having to do manual analysis live inside of Revit. All right, we've covered a lot of tools. We talked in depth about View Creator Spreadsheet Link, Schedule Excel, Invisibility Advisor, and Occupant Flow Analyzer. Those five tools are some fantastic tools. Four of them can be used by pretty much any discipline out there. We also kind of talked about a number of other tools. We didn't go in depth, but we talked about a lot of other tools here in the project suite. I strongly suggest you all go out and try and get this suite if you don't already have it and work with it yourself. You might ask, well, Sean, how can I get my hands on this suite? Well, this is what you can do. If you go up to the solidcad.ca website, you go to their products page, Inside of their partner projects, you'll find our software right here, CTC software. And when you click on that, right near the top of that page, once that loads, on their products page, the first tool actually is the BIM project suite, the suite we were talking about today. And you can either get a free trial of it, or if you're so compelled, you could buy it right now and get this in your firm and start using this live on your projects, saving yourself a ton of time. Fantastic tool set there. Sean? I do want to mention... Some, you go ahead, Mohit. Uh, sorry to, to cut you off there. We do have a question from Ryan Bradley. Yes, what's the question? Um, it says, he's asking, are you able to use occupancy flow analyzer to calculate distances to nearest fire extinguishers, fire valves, and hoses? Sure. What I would do with that, if I was inside this, this occupancy flow analyzer, instead of targeting the doors as critical paths, 
what I would do is I would target those, those different elements that you want to check distances to. So I could check from every room in my model, for every person, for every room and every space, distances to things like the fire extinguishers or fire hoses. If those were my target elements, that's what it would go to. You could absolutely target them instead of doors. 100% yes. I hadn't thought about using it that way. That's, that's kind of clever. I like it. Yeah, this can be used for that as well. Because it's any occupant flow, not just egress analysis, but uh, you know, analysis to how do I get to certain elements, and it can auto-target that for you. All right. I was going to mention here real quickly about the installation. I think I already talked about this a little earlier, where you can get this from Revit 2017 through 2020. The tool that you want to download actually is 2020, the latest version of this. 2020 automatically installs on all of the different versions. I think that uh, maybe I've got to talk to SolidCAD and get them to update their site real quick here. Um, but the, the, the actual download for this free trial should be bringing you to the latest and greatest download, which is 2020, and it will auto-install on top of all of the different supported versions of Revit. If they're installed or not, it'll, it'll let it actually be there. In fact, if you don't have 2020 installed yet, Revit 2020, this will put the files that you need there, and when Revit 2020 does get installed on your computer, our CTC Express tools will just magically show up there on the ribbon ready for you to be able to use it. So, uh, you know, it makes it super simple for IT as well. In fact, IT can silently roll these tools out if they want to. They don't even have to manually go desk by desk and do a sneaker configuration. They can just push this via Active Directory and have it install these tools silently. 